Today, I'm sitting down with Told in Stone, a well-established ancient history creator, and we chatted about Roman history, architecture, ancient militaries, and much more. So check it out. I guess a good point of entry would be to describe how you have arrived at making history content on YouTube and what your, you know, your background is as it pertains to Roman history. I think like most people who are history buffs, you can't pinpoint a moment where you started being interested in the ancient world. It was always just kind of there. Um, but it was activated for me, I would say, there's this passion for Roman history in particular. Um, when I was 14 and went to Rome with my parents and saw the monuments for the first time, um, I was always had a special fascination for ancient monuments. It's why it's told in stone. Um, I focused on architecture at first. Um, but uh, I also had a, a very good Latin teacher in high school. I was lucky to have Latin at all in high school. And I majored in the classics, ended up doing this thing, doing it all professionally um, in uh, college and then in grad school. But I never imagined being a YouTube creator. That was off my radar entirely. I thought it'd be a nice standard academic. You know, I'd maybe watch YouTube occasionally, but never actually make stuff. Uh, then, however, I ended up leaving academia for a number of reasons, um, above all there being very few good jobs anymore, um, and found myself scrambling. I had all this training in the ancient, in ancient history and no way to use it because there's really no jobs outside of being a professor if you have a degree in ancient history. Um, so I decided to write this book, my first book, uh, The Orange Run on the Shelf up there behind me, uh, Naked Statues. And while writing that book, I had the idea of promoting it on YouTube. Uh, I knew nothing about YouTube content creation. I never dreamed of even creating a channel. But uh, I just plunged blindly into it, um, you know, made some really bad videos, uh, you know, poor quality, just yeah. pretty much me lecturing at them. Um, but and so for two years, to no one's surprise but my own, nobody watched my videos because I didn't know how to promote them. I didn't know how to make them. I really didn't know what I was doing at all. But um, I did produce videos about once a month, kind of as a hobby more than anything else for, you know, a few years. And then uh, in the spring of 2021, one of my videos of absolute nowhere went viral. Uh, and that gave me a chance to, so that to put my foot in the door of actual you know, content creation, having a real following, having uh, more than a few hundred subscribers, um, and gave me the idea that I could actually make something out of YouTube, a going concern, a, even a career out of it, though that would still seem really strange in the beginning. Um, now, of course, I'm more or less full time on YouTube besides writing stuff. And it still kind of surprises me. I don't know how I got to this point, but um, right. so I, I, fell in, I fell into it is the short answer. Just serendipity, I guess. I stumbled into YouTube and uh, against all odds, it kind of worked. So, so at this point, then you have left academia and you are doing this basically full time? Yes. Yeah. Academia, if I was offered the perfect job, maybe I'd, I'd think about it again. But yeah. now I'm actually making as much money as I would have um, in academia and have a lot more freedom. You know, academia has a lot of cool perks, um, but also a lot of paperwork. <laughs> and so uh, right. I'm being spared that part of it. Well, you know, what's interesting is uh, in a previous episode on this podcast, I had spoken with a guy around my age who's currently working in a just kind of dull banking job. And he mm -hmm. loves history. And he talked about wanting to eventually pivot to working maybe in a museum out West because he's mm -hmm. not into Roman history, but he likes uh, Western history kind mm -hmm. of that that period and i had recommended him to your channel but i i do remember us maybe off camera talking like yeah it's i don't know how realistic it really is to do that maybe i'll end up going into the coast guard instead mm -hmm. and yeah like outside of you said being a professor there really is no i don't want to say no hope because it sounds particularly depressing but no good mm -hmm. prospects for young people getting into the history field outside of colleges it's very hard. I mean, there is some museum work, um, either as a curator or working in as a conservator for artifacts, but that job market is almost as bad as the academic one, believe it or not. It's, it's pretty tough. It's not as bad in American history as it is in ancient history, because many universities um, are shutting down their ancient history programs, their Greek and Latin, because no one you know, really learns them anymore. Right. Um, but it's still pretty dire. Um, many universities focus more on STEM, you know, as science and mathematics over humanities, and they just uh, down downplay all of the the classic side of things. But outside of academia and museum work, um, there's this whole sphere we call public history, which is just doing the humanities um, as outreach, um, either on YouTube um, or like with, say, a museum, you're like acting as their digital director or something. Mm -hmm. So there, there's some potential there, I think, for young people who want to try and stay in the humanities without just throwing the dream away. But there aren't many jobs and they aren't very well paying, unfortunately. I think that, that that's a growth industry. There's much there in the future. 
but uh, I got very lucky, to be honest, to be able to make a career out of public history. Uh, you know, most YouTubers in history have much smaller channels because the interest is so fragmented. You know, people will do one hyper specific thing and they, you know, people who are their audience love it. They're a few hundred, they're a few thousand people, but you can't uh, make a ton of ad money on that sort of audience. So it's a, it's a hard balance to strike to both follow your passion and, you know, keep eating. <laughs> but uh, I was fortunate enough to find this through YouTube, um, a balance. Right. So in that regard, then, would you say that YouTube has been somewhat of a saving grace for this field? And, and it's given a, a new opportunity to not just you, but people that maybe have like a hyper specific interest and they, they don't know if there's a job out there for it, but maybe content mm -hmm. could be a good alternative. I think so. I think YouTube is um, sort of a, a metonym, uh, uh, an embodiment, uh, an epitomization of the entire internet in some ways, and that it makes things that you're interested in, often very niche interests, available to the entire world. It allows you to share what you're doing, what you're passionate about with everybody. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, the hard part is that it's also commercialized in such a way that you can't make a lot of money or any money at all if you are catering to a very small audience. And so YouTube pushes people, even people who are very talented and have these passions, into making kind of generic content, content that will please a large audience and make them money, but at the expense often of quality and of their own interests. And so it's like anything, you know, you, you have to, um, you please two masters, both you know, yourself um, and the almighty algorithm which you know, no one totally understands in terms of how it's delivering consumers to you. Sure. And so it's, it's the marketplace uh, writ large, I guess. You know, it's a, a wonderfully egalitarian marketplace that you can reach anybody all over the world who cares about what you do, but you only reach them if YouTube and its infinite lack of wisdom decides that you should reach them. And that's, you know, who knows how that's actually working in most cases. So I, I do, I, I'm very grateful they've found YouTube, but I'm also... I guess, uh, aware of the drawbacks of YouTube's business model. Right. And, and you had mentioned that video that first went viral and, and the algorithm, mm -hmm. given that you're studying or, or making history content about history, does it ever feel like there's a particular Russian roulette to the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, what would you say? The, the impact of your content and, and you'd like, oh, well that video went incredibly viral and I have no idea why. And then this one that I'm really mm -hmm. passionate about only got 20,000 views sucks you know every time i think i understand i begin to understand youtube something like that happens where i'm either blown away by video's performance or deeply underwhelmed by something that i poured all kinds of time and effort into i, I don't know i mean th there's some obvious patterns so for my own channel people like uh, the coliseum for example they like um, monumental architecture um, they like um you know fun questions about, about daily life in ancient rome but beyond those very generic kind of subcategories, it's hard to decide or determine any real pattern to it. It just seems to happen sometimes. And often my videos that do go viral go viral for reasons that I have no control over. It's some other video that is doing well, and I'm being kicked up in the wake. You know, I'm being recommended after that video. So it's a, it can be frustrating to have so little control over your own destiny in some ways. You have your core audience, and you know how this works too, where people who will watch anything you make but that audience is not very big. And so beyond that little hardcore of true believers and told in stone, you have to cast things out there, a variety of things out there and hope some of it works. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I have no, no wisdom to share about that. It just seems to work sometimes and then it just doesn't otherwise. Well, something that yeah. I had thought about, um, and I'm assuming the video that you had been referring to, was it the one where you talked about seating at the Roman Colosseum? That's my most successful video, but it's not the one that went viral first, actually. Uh, the one that went viral first was called The Hidden History of St. Peter's Basilica. Okay. And it was about that church and about uh, all the Roman stuff that was reused in that building. So a very kind of niche topic. Right. But people, but it had a sexy title. So people got intrigued by that, I think. And I see. You know, that, that was the key. Okay, because one thing that I had wondered is that that video about the seating at the Roman Colosseum has... Mm -hmm quite a relatable topic in that we go to arenas today and we have things like mm -hmm. seat geek and are like oh sitting mm -hmm. courtside and you get to sing the the players <laughs> right. would be amazing and and in your video you talked about you know the varying tiers of the equestrians and the senators and then going up to eventually just the peasants and the upper decks and <laughs> right i was thinking maybe that one was ex as successful as it was because people could in a way put, put themselves right. in the shoes of those people there and it's mm -hmm. even though it was 2000 plus years ago, it's still actually quite a relevant topic. Do you think that's part of why it did as well as it did? 
Oh, certainly. Um, you know, the things that people latch on to, it seems, are the ones where it's not just about the great figures of the ancient world, the, the Caesars and the Cleopatras. It's about, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, a, a Fabia six-pack or whatever, you know, the, the, the standard Roman uh, doing, going about his daily life. So that one did very well. Um, one about uh, bad neighborhoods in ancient Rome did very well. You know, where you try and find these equivalences between ancient and modern life and just think through them. So I, I do hope to do more of that in this coming year, where I'm just uh, both other legacies of Rome in everyday life, um, or you know, thinking about what it was like to just be an ordinary Roman. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to do well sometimes because our sources are so skewed towards the elite, where we know what you know this senator or this equestrian was thinking about. I don't know their their foie gras on their plate. Right. We don't know about you know the ordinary Roman who's dipping his bread in olive oil and trying to make ends meet in this you know ragged apartment upstairs, but we can at least imagine their lives. And uh, I hope to do more of that in the Untold in Stone. Right. I, I can't quite remember the name of the channel at this time, but there is one channel that I really like where it's uh, it's a guy going over food across history. Oh and, yes. Yeah, you might know who I'm talking about, but it's I've watched many of his videos. He talks about like, um, like the bread that sailors would eat on the high seas. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm sure he's done a video about Roman breakfasts and all that. And I wonder if, if part of, I mean, it's obviously very well done, the content, but also mm -hmm. I wonder why maybe it's done as well as it has, because we still eat 2000 years later, we still do the mm -hmm. same things that Romans would have done. And we can in a way relate to these people much more than, you know, as you say, like, Caesar mm -hmm. reaching over for his grapes from his platter and like we can't relate <laughs> exactly. to that. Um but yeah. but I guess as a way to maybe even brainstorm future content ideas, are there any mm -hmm. aspects of Roman life that you think are actually still quite similar to modern life? And maybe things that have not been talked about as much like food and entertainment mm -hmm. is obviously very big, but maybe some less flashy aspects that we never think about. Mhm. Mm uh, yeah, well, actually, the channel you were talking about is Tasting History with that's Max right. Miller. Yeah, that's um, right. And he, he does a great job. Um, and I think you're right, that it's about how immediately appealing it is to just think with the food, because we all know these tastes, we have these textures, you know, we, we've eaten most of this stuff, at least in some form or other. And that is that immediate connection with the past in some way. Um, but as for your idea of brainstorming, so one thing I, I have been thinking about is um, finding an apartment in ancient Rome. I think that'd be a fun way to yeah, think about that'd be cool the whole real estate market, which is very complex in ancient Rome. It's, it's the New York of, anti of antiquity, very high rents. Uh, people are squeezing these little bitty studios, um, you know, rents usually for one year. And uh, so on the, the day that leases expire, there's, there's mayhem all over Rome as people are moving left and right. Um, some people can't find a house and end up living under the bridges. And, and so there's um, the whole gamut of Roman societies involved in the real estate market. And that's not really been touched yet on YouTube. So that, that's one, I, one thing I'm trying to do in the next, let's say three or four months. Okay. As we delve deeply into the real estate market. How, um, how, how extensive is the knowledge around that topic? Cause that seems, although quite relatable, but it seems still quite niche. It is very niche. What we have is, um, are, are things like painted advertisements from Pompeii on the walls. Like, you know, uh, you know, Fabius is putting up his apartment for this many sestertii, you know, starting June 15th or whatever it would be. Uh, and so we have these scattered references and enough scholarship on those references to piece together some sense of that that world. Not a, not a ton, but enough for a 15 minute video that goes over the essentials, hopefully. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, because because one thing that I've wondered often, and I'm sure this is just, you know, me being a layman, is when I watch a video about history, I'm like, how do they know that? You know, uh, mm -hmm. how, what is what is really beyond, you know, let's say uh, Marcus Aurelius's meditations as a journal where it's written mm -hmm. down, you know, like, how do we actually know what life was like? Is it is it often through um, is it just through writings and journals? Usually it's like like I guess what I'm asking is, how do you usually do your research? Like, what's the mm -hmm. best ways you found of gathering information about history so old? So normally, you know, I'm not on the front lines. I'm not doing original research for these videos. I, I'm, you know, the guy behind the dudes fighting in the, on the front line, picking up the debris they've left. Um, secondary scholarship. Okay. Uh, so often, archaeology is a huge part of how we know about the daily life of, of everyday Romans. Because our, our literary sources, and they are extensive. You can see behind the wall behind me that those uh, green and red books, those are all primary sources, Greek and Latin. Uh, and it's a tiny fraction of what's available. But what we know from those books, uh, 
how the elite lived. We have uh, things like epic poetry. We have um, the histories, the formal histories of this emperor, that emperor's reign. And that tells us a lot. That provides the framework within which we understand the ancient world. But for the everyday past, we have to look at places like Pompeii and look at these houses, look at the furniture, look at the carbonized food. Um, and all of that provides – we often use the analogy of a mosaic. It's like a, one of the little stones, the tesserae in a mosaic. And every excavation, every new study adds one or two more little tesserae to this vast mosaic. So we'll never know everything. We'll never know more than a tiny fraction of what was experienced, uh, seen, felt, and known by the ancient world. But we will be able to recover more and more as we're more sophisticated about seeing the evidence we have and using it. I, I did a video once a couple of years ago that, that you may recall back in 2021. There's this ridiculous TikTok about how the Romans never even existed. It was this this whole meme thing. Really? For a while. And I, I made kind of a joke video responding to that about how much evidence we have for the Romans. And it really is amazing, uh, you know, how it stacks up. There, there's the literary sources, which, you know, work out, let's say, a thousand bound volumes of this literary texts. And then we have uh, literally uh, hundreds upon hundreds of volumes of published papyri from Egypt, for example, that go through things like tax registers, um, notes to, uh, you know, someone's sister, little bits of everyday life that do allow us to recover huge amounts in the ancient world. Uh, we have millions of inscriptions from all over the ancient world and quite literally a billion ancient coins, which tell us um, and ranges from their inscriptions to how they're found, how the economy worked. And, and so th there's often non-intuitive sources of evidence um, scattered all over the place. The hard part is synthesizing all of it into some kind of coherent picture. And for my videos are often so piecemeal, it's answering one weird question. And so what I'll do is I'll read I'll begin by reading a few articles in the classical dictionary, for example, and that'll bring me the, in the bibliography, there will be secondary sources I can then read and do my research on that basis. Um, it's rare that I'm doing anything like real primary um, dissertation style research for a YouTube video because I don't have to, often, right. and it's all been done before. Right. Um, but I do sometimes cobble together different topics that have been touched, touched before in scholarship in different ways. Um, I did a video a couple years ago about um, how much of the gold that now exists was mined by the Romans? It was sort of a thought experiment. And we can't know exactly, of course. Um, but we can think with the numbers we do have. And that was kind of an original research topic I got way into the weeds on for no good reason. Um, but it, it was fun to think with. And for, for me as a, a scholar, someone who came out of academia, um, half the thrill of doing what I do is not necessarily finding new research, but finding new ways to ask old questions and then present them on YouTube um, as something that's kind of fresh and interesting. Right. Well, I, I feel like it's honestly not a big deal to be the secondary scholar in a way, because mm -hmm. a lot of people are starting to coin this term being a synthesizer on YouTube, or you're mm -hmm. rather than being the the direct expert of something, you are taking what would normally be an unimaginable amount of work for an average person to gather and say, I will package this all up into a nice 10 to 15 mm -hmm. minute video. That That's the job of a creator. And sure. Like there's this one financial creator that I, I used to watch called Max Maher, and he would comb through, you know, dozens and dozens of pages of tax documents and the most boring, mundane things that we don't want to do, but he mm -hmm. will happily do it because that's the burden that he's lift, put upon himself because he wants to be the person that is the authority for that kind of information. So mm -hmm. I think that's fine. But one thing that I had thought about was given all of that, the extent of the knowledge that we have about Roman history, does it feel like maybe the historian in you cringes when you hear about things like the library of Alexandria burning down. Uh, we lose 500 years of mathematics like that. Like that hmm. must be such a, a stain. Like, oh man, that's uh, terrible. The worst ones are when it gets almost to the Renaissance. It gets so close to being saved and copied and then is lost. So like when the, the Turks took uh, Constantinople in 1453, in the fall of the Byzantine Empire, um, there were some texts that made it all the way to 1453 and then were lost. Um, so there's this universal history of a guy named Diodorus, not one of the best histories, but one of the most comprehensive that existed in all 20 books until then, and then it was burned. And so now we have lots of little fragments of it. Um, and often, you know, it, there, because in the Middle Ages, so much is just allowed to decay, basically. It's not, not big fires that cause all the destruction. It's just the they're not copied out. You know, usually papyrus lasts about three or two or three hundred years. After that, it just falls into fragments in a European climate. And if it's not being copied out every two or three hundred years, it's just lost. Um, and so we know of all these libraries just kind of wither, just fall to dust because nobody's bothering to copy them out. 
Um, and uh, it, it is maddening. And we, we find these scraps of papyri in Egypt that give us, let's say, a page of lost history. And it's good. It's so good. And you're just like, oh, and the rest is banished. Right. We have one page of this guy we call the Axorhynchus historian, um, who's pretty much a successor to, to Thucydides and very much like him, very high quality analysis and a very incisive, very clear Greek. And we have one, like two pages of this guy and that's it. The rest has been lost. We don't, know who, we don't even know his name. We, we can guess, but we don't know who, who it even was. Right. And uh, yes, it can be terribly tantalizing that, you know, people just didn't care for all those centuries and it all fell away. Right. Or, or you think about um, how quite recently our standards of archaeology have improved. And even back maybe mm -hmm. a few hundred years, they were just like smashing at it with pickaxes. Oh, and yeah. Destroying. Away. Yeah. Um, it used to be a custom. Um, the Etruscans, people lived in Rome or in Italy before the Romans, uh, left these wonderful tombs filled with pottery and all kinds of other other wonderful goods. And when they began to open these tombs in the 18th century, it was customary to just smash a bunch of the pottery to keep the value high of the one the pots they did take out. Um, just, you know, grind it to dust because otherwise the market would fall apart. And so, yeah, it, it can be terribly frustrating to read about things like that, where it's just like, well, you know, some duke or other decides to smash up this tomb and nothing you can do about it because it was on his right. land. One of the questions, I guess, going back to Rome that I had was, you know, given somewhat on this topic of, of why there is so much information or, or you know, like got to hold on to those little tidbits while you find them. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it is that Rome among all the other empires we have throughout history has become like the one pop culture icon. Is it, mm -hmm. do you think it's because there just happens to be so much information in comparison to say Persia or, or other dynasties? Mm -hmm. or, or do you think there's something particular about Rome that just seems to captivate us? The sheer amount of information is definitely part of it. We know more about the Romans than about any other ancient civilization besides ancient China. Um, but, but really what it comes down to it is the fact is that we in America are part of um, a European culture, you know, a, a, Europe, a Eurocentric culture um, that whose roots lie in everything from you know, law, language, um, even considerations of art, music, uh, all lie in the ancient world. And even though we're very far removed from those roots and even farther removed than people in Europe might be, um, those roots are real. So here in America, you know, the Constitution, of course, is a very stylized Roman Republic that's been you know, reimagined in terms of Enlightenment theory. Um, English language is about half Latinate by vocabulary. Um, there's just so many ways that you can, so many filaments and roots trace backward to antiquity that uh, even if you reject what antiquity means, if you don't like what the Romans did or what they stand for, and I guess we all have problems with the Romans in different ways, you can't deny the power of their influence. Um, it's just there wherever you look at it. Um, actually, I, I did a book signing a couple of days ago, and somebody asked me a question kind of similar about you know how the Romans are still relevant today. And I brought up the fact that uh, in Louisiana, they still use the Napoleonic Code, which is just Roman law, but you know, kind of brought up to date. It's that in Louisiana, you're still being, you're st Roman law is still in force. Really? And just a, a nice little way to, um, in, in some ways, a nice way to, to epitomize how much the Romans are still with us in all kinds of surprising ways. Um, so I, I think it's, it's that, just the sheer breadth of Roman influence on European and therefore American culture. And of course, Hollywood, you know, the, the, right. the, the gladiators are fun. You know, we have all these, these wonderful figures that we can conjure with, like, like Caesar and Cleopatra, as I mentioned before. And so in, in pop culture, uh, the combination of Roman war gladiators and Greek myth is so pervasive. Even if you, if you know, know nothing about the academic side of things, you've been exposed to uh, mm. the classical world by those ways. Right. So, so I guess in a way, both metaphorically and physically, all roads do lead to Rome. <laughs> Very right? much so. Mm -hmm. So, so in that regard, then, what would you say are some of your maybe favorite aspects of Rome that still manifest in modern society? Like, like not maybe it's not something as basic as like the aqueduct or something uh, like that, sure. but, mm -hmm. but maybe the innovations that, that Rome brought us that you think are just particularly fascinating. So as I mentioned earlier, I, I began told in stone and began my academic career with a real fascination um, in architecture above all uh, in the built environment. And, and once you begin seeing uh, ancient influence on modern architecture. You can't unsee it. It's everywhere. Not only like a collinated bank, for example, but everything from how we think about, um, like in this room, that there's molding, the little crown molding there at the top towards the ceiling. That comes from an ancient, ancient, ancient temple originally. It's how the Greeks used to frame their the attics of their temples. Um, so the spaces in which we live are totally 
uh, framed by Roman design, which I think is always fascinating. Uh, as for other things, you know, thinking about innovations, I, I, I did a, a two-part video series a couple of years ago on um, how close the Romans came to an industri industrial revolution. And the answer is they never came remotely close. Their society was not set up for it. They were never going to be creating railroads or anything. But they had some wonderfully innovative ways of using very primitive technologies, like this thing called the uh, the vallis, which is a, a thresher, pretty much a primitive uh, kind of combine where a mule is kind of hopping along and he's pushing um, a tray that has these razored edges on it. And so it cuts the grain at just the right height so the heads fall into the tray. Um, you know, the Romans had all these... Uh, elaborate hydraulic pumps for their uh, mines in Spain. Um, water wheels worked by slaves who are like, on treadmills pretty much, We're bringing up water from hundreds of feet below and dumping on the surface. And, and so th there are all kinds of ways the Romans got around their own uh, technological limitations. And that kind of ingenuity in the face of uh, a total want of theory or uh, any engineering schools, anything like that, um, is always fascinating too. I, I think there's a there's a broad misconception from a lot of people that Rome, despite being so old, it's like they were just primitive, and and there was a lot of, uh, you know, I mean there was barbarity in many ways, but there mm -hmm. there were things that were like, oh well, the Romans were just so old that there's no way they like how could they have possibly known how to farm correctly? But would you? Mm -hmm. we, I mean, I'm sure you would agree, but you would say that Rome was surprisingly innovative and advanced for their time, and and kind of as you say, lay the groundwork for, for the rest of modern society. Um, yeah, I, I always tell my students that, uh, just remember, they were as smart as we are. You know, right. they're, they're thinking about these things. They don't have the technology we do, but they are just as smart as we are. Um, and the, uh, you know, the, we, know very, we know personally very few ancient people because they haven't written as much. But the few people who did write enough, we actually know them as personalities. Like a Cicero, for example, we have uh, hundreds of letters he wrote to his friends. Um, or like St. Augustine, for example, from a couple hundred, a couple centuries later, um, or the Emperor Julian, people who wrote about their reflections, how they're thinking about the world around them. Um, that for me is even more intriguing than the technological side of things, because they're people who are living in a very different uh, moral universe, a world in which uh, slavery is accepted, in which absolute inequality is just part of the game, mm. uh, in which um, you know all kinds of brutality that we would be horrified by are you know endemic. Um, but these people who are thinking, or Marcus Aurelius, are thinking very seriously about what it means to be human, what it means to be a good person, um, you know, how to live well, um, rightly, justly in this world that to us is so alien. Uh, and so there, there's this interesting way in which the Romans are simultaneously so like us, it can be kind of painful to see, and yet so profoundly different that it's just uh, unsettling. You know, it's like, how do we negotiate this civilization, which we owe so much and seems so very familiar in ways? And yet is at the same time fundamentally different from ours. And I think that that's the real task of history is to kind of negotiate between that those similarities and those differences. You have to see, um, okay, we owe this to the Rome. We can see this parallel with Rome. But at the same time, we have to understand the Romans on their own terms, which are so different from ours. Um, and yes, the Roman army uh, is incredibly effective at what it does. Right. It's, uh, you know, it, it's a technology. It's, it's the same as its opponents, really. It has no technological advantage. It has the advantage of training. It's a professional force. Where none of its opponents are real professionals in any any true sense. Um, people go in for 25 years and are trained to be very, very good at, you know, the <laughs> stabbing and twisting pretty much. Uh, and uh, it really, and how, of course, they're great engineers. They're, they're really combat engineers. They're building trenches. They're building roads. They're building bridges. Uh, and for me, of course, my archaeological, ar my architectural focus, that's uh, a lot of fun to watch in action um, on the ground, rather. Here's something I was really curious about. And I, you mentioned earlier your fascination with people throughout history. Mm -hmm. I had written a question mainly about emperors. I had asked, what do you think mm -hmm. are the most consequential emperors, or, or the most consequential? But I want to expand that to potentially, like you said, Cicero and people that are maybe just politicians or, or writers. Mm -hmm. Is there, maybe picking one person is a little bit too confining, but is there any particular group of people or person that you think was like the consequential person in history. Often people say Marcus Aurelius, right? But is there anyone mm -hmm. that you think had such an, a profound impact that it would be unfair to not mention them? Well, I mean, I guess that the, the palm always goes in terms of sheer influence, the people who start major religions, right? You know, so you'd say like a, a Jesus or a Mohammed or a Buddha um, for all of history. But leaving aside people who are involved in uh, the great religions, um, I would say in some ways uh, Socrates, actually, who, who founds um, the Western intellectual tradition. 
um, often through his pupil Plato, of course, and then and, and Plato's own pupil Aristotle. But these men frame how we think about the world and think about thought itself. It's really, the rest of the rest of Western tradition. You know, even now uh, there's a famous uh, quote about how all philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato, written by a 20th century philosopher. And so I would say um, either uh, either uh, Socrates or Homer, because these two people pioneered how, in the one case, we think about ethical life. In other case, how we write about experience. You know, Homer is the first work of Western literature, and all of Greek and later Roman literature is looking back at Homer in all kinds of interesting ways. It gets very far away from epic poetry, you know, you know, both generically and in terms of content. Um, but Homer sets the tone for thinking about for creating a new way of looking at the human experience. So I think that you always have to look at um, great authors, uh, great philosophers, because even if they don't have a very eventful life and don't change the world directly the way a conqueror might or a king might, they change the way we think about the world. And that, I think, is ultimately more influential. Right. Because one thing that I've not, not debated at large, but my friends and I have debated before, is if we had given these people through history a different time period, like if someone mm -hmm. today said the things that Socrates said, we would mm -hmm. all be like, well, duh, that's obvious. You know, we, mm -hmm. we, we have the benefit of looking back and saying, well, of course we know how to think now. And, mm -hmm. and I made the same point before when talking about the Beatles, because I think the Beatles are extremely overrated personally. <laughs> but uh -huh. I know that for their time, that was probably revolutionary to hear that kind of music and really mm -hmm. push rock music, you know, rock into the uh, mm -hmm. forefront of pop culture. And so while, you know, I don't know anything specific about what Socrates has written, I imagine that, you know, at that time, that must have been Complete mm -hmm. unimaginable to, to have an organized democracy or to like, no, let's think about it this way. When to us, mm -hmm. it's like, no, that's incredibly basic, but we are benefiting from the last 2000 years of that hindsight. Well, yeah, you, if you turn the Iliad in now as an English assignment, you get a C, right? Or whether right. you're first of all, really confused by you're turning in, you know, 14,000 lines of poetry, but it, it's more that, um, yeah, we, we've, um, once the groundwork is laid, you go beyond that. You know, you evolve beyond it, and so a, a classic is both something that was innovative at its own time and has had, in some ways, stood the test of time. And uh, so even now, I mean, the Iliad it gets terribly tedious. You know, X stabbed Y. You know, Y fell in the dust bleeding. Z then also stabbed Y. You know, things like that. Uh, but at the same time, you can see how the roots of what we do now, how we think now, and and talk about language now, lies in this this work, these works of literature. So you're right. You know, it, yeah. If the Beatles showed up now, it'd be like, oh, okay. You know, what, what's their deal? Right. Um, but in the '60s, right, they're innovating and laying the groundwork for the rest of rock and pop. Um, you know, that's the thing about being a pioneer. You might not do it all that all that well initially, but you're doing it first, and that's what matters. A good way to end the conversation would be to talk about how Rome fell, because I mm -hmm. think this is something that people nowadays actually talk about quite a bit. Like, is America? falling mm -hmm. like the romans and all of this and why do you think for, for one rome fell the way it did and do you think that as a society today given all the things we just talked about we could study from and like let's not forget why that happened and let's make sure we don't for example um i think a funny quote is the the romans did not hear the barbarians covering coming because they had their windows closed because they had air conditioning <laughs> right do you think that there's anything that we are blind to from history that we should learn from? Well, the question of why Rome fell um, is what we call as historians overdetermined. That is, it has many, many causes, and picking out just one or two can be misleading. Right. So ultimately, right, it's the barbarians. There's an external cause, um, barbarians pouring over the frontier and overwhelming the Roman economy and Roman army um, at a time when both are very weak for different reasons. But of course, the fact that the Roman barbarians are able to overwhelm the Roman society in this way um, is attributable to a, a lot of deeper seated causes. And it's not so much that the Romans became more luxurious or less attuned to their own defense. They had a very large and well-trained army almost to the very end. Is that the Roman, both the Roman economy and the Roman imperial system became less and less efficient, less good um, at both getting taxes from people and winning the loyalty of people. And why that happens, uh, there's so many different ways to think about it. Um, so the, the Roman society in the West, or the, sorry, the Roman political system is weakened by a long series of civil wars. Um, and that's really why the barbarians can come in 
um, when they do, because the Romans are fighting each other in a way that gives them less time and bandwidth to cope with external invaders. Um, at the same time, uh, the Roman economy is, what we would say, diversifying in different directions. It's becoming more and more regional, less focused on Rome itself. Um, and, and at the same time, the big local landowners, the guys who had been the focal points of loyalty to Rome, um, are seeing less and less incentive to stay loyal to Rome. Also, everyone's Christian now, um, which is both a source of loyalty to Rome in some ways, and also disloyalty if you're not an Orthodox Christian. Mm. And so there's all kinds of new, I would say, we call it in geology, lines of cleavage, uh, fracture points that have evolved, that have emerged across the empire. And with the unparalleled external uh, force, the barbarians at the gates coming in, overwhelming the armies, um, the empire could have coped with that in previous times, but the empire become more and more fragile over the century of last cent previous century because of these different pressures, social, economic, and religious. And so it's both internal and external by Rome falls. Um, you know, an empire of that scale in the pre-modern world is always an enormous accomplishment. That it stayed that long is incredible. It's a fragile thing. Um, just everything, enough things failed at the right time for the whole edifice to come down. Whereas in the East, of course, the Eastern Empire did not fall for another thousand years. The things, all the clocks didn't tick the same time in the East. Um, they remained resilient enough. And so I, I would say that as a historian, my, my, my takeaway from all of that is there's no one cause, no one factor, but the society became less resilient for all kinds of reasons at a time when there was a terrible external blow to uh, the Roman military and uh, Roman society as a whole. And they couldn't cope. They weren't flexible enough to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So as far as lessons for today, um, I am an enormous skeptic of people who compare America and Rome. Uh, it, they're just such different animals. Uh, you, you can't compare them. There's no, no historical rule about how long empires last or why they fall can be applied to both Rome and to America. Except that, I would say, that the most powerful states and empires can become complacent in ways, can become self-satisfied with their place in the world and stop innovating. And the Romans, in different ways, did stop innovating, I would say. Um, they stopped trying to uh, adapt to the barbarians coming in. They didn't do it quickly enough. They became set in their ways. And so I, I guess the fact that the leading empire or state in a given geopolitical configuration tends to evolve more slowly because everything it's doing has worked in the past. Um, maybe that's a lesson for the modern world, that not to be complacent in our, our status and our wealth and our power because we got to where we are by innovating in all kinds of ways, both diplomatically, technologically, you name it. And once you become content with your position in the world, um, Ross is a dangerous thing. And so right. we kind of leave it, at, leave it at that maybe. Well, that's interesting because as, as someone, and you know, we live in America looking outside from the world, it is interesting because I do think that there is a certain amount of disloyalty and and this is not to get political but mm -hmm. i i do feel like with the advent of the digital era which is mm -hmm. really only the past few decades it's become far easier for cultures to become more homogenous and we in a way are not as quite as distinct like you mentioned how mm -hmm. christianity started to take over the roman empire and that kind of uh it changed the cultural dynamics essentially and mm -hmm. in the same way, I mean, it's not the same thing, but how social media has allowed us to, you know, our, ex our reach in the world is far greater than it possibly could have been even 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think that your point about complacency is absolutely true because I think people down to even seemingly mundane things would look back in, let's say the thirties and the forties of America and like, wow, they were so innovative or, you know, Henry mm -hmm. Ford creating the assembly line and all these things. Mm -hmm. And we were just like popping out inventions left and right. And now it feels like everything is just plastic and basic. And we've kind of lost mm -hmm. our edge in a way. And I just recently had uh, another creator on, um, he, he's in the gaming space, but he talked about the point of don't quit when it gets easy, not when it gets hard, but when it gets easy, because mm -hmm. when you're on top of the world, then it's very easy to not only lose your humility, but also lose your your uh your your judgment on how powerful your enemies are you know it's mm -hmm. when you underestimate people around you then it's very easy for them to rise up and you're kind of seeing that now with other countries around the world and mm -hmm. i think americans have been complacent for the last i guess 70 80 years since world war ii ended and now it's like no there's new kids on the block and and we cannot mm -hmm. maintain this level of we're going to be on top forever 
It is. It's more of an attitude than anything else. And the Romans were very complacent for a long time with, with justice, honestly. You know, they, they, they were, we're, we are the most important empire that ever has been. and The whole world would be ours if we bothered to conquer it. Um, and that's not why they fell, but it didn't help things. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that, that's the only real comparison you can make between these great superpowers that have risen and fallen and that things tend to get kind of ossified. Um, you know, the arteries harden and that can be a very bad thing. So I guess just to close it out, as you said, you're writing a book. So is there anywhere that people can go to find that if and when it's available? So that book, um, which will be called The Edge of Empire, um, will be not, not, not be out for a couple of years, but you okay. can buy in the meantime, uh, the books here to the side of my head, um, which are uh, uh, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants. That's the first one with the orange cover. Um, and Insane Emperors, Sunken Cities, and Earthquake Machines. That's the, the blue cover one there on the, on the left. Um, and these are both questions of, or rather books about, uh, well, trivia about the ancient world, but, or, or there's a series of questions and answers. So about 35 and then 50 questions in the other, um, where people ask me kind of bizarre questions about the ancient world. Everything from like, uh, did they wear swimsuits um, to um, how they get elephants for the Colosseum? And then I address these questions in these uh, short and hopefully kind of fast paced essays about X or Y in the ancient world. But uh, you can find those on my uh, on .com, on Amazon, anywhere books are sold. And uh, my YouTube channel, Told in Stone, is also out there if you're interested in ancient history. So uh, feel free to check it out. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. This was, um, this was a pleasure. And um, I'm personally, honestly, just a fan of your content. So I'm always looking forward to the thank next you. video coming out. So thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, all the best.